Hey guys, Kim here, and you are tuned into Kim E, the Diabetes MP. Today, we're going to keep moving forward with our discussion over prediabetes, and we're going to talk about prediabetes treatment. Okay, now, if you have not already, I've already made a couple of videos that go over the overview of prediabetes and even talks about what insulin resistance is. So if you have not watched those videos, stop this video, go back, watch that video, and come back and watch this video because they're kind of moving together, okay? The, some of the things I'm going to talk about, I'm going to reference um, the prediabetes overview vid video, but if you don't know what I talked about there, there are going to be some things that you may not understand in this video. So I want to make sure that we're on the same page. So let's recap a little bit, okay? Just give a little refresher. What is prediabetes? Now, in a nutshell, simply put, it's when the blood glucose, the blood sugar is elevated, but it's not quite at the threshold for a person to be diagnosed with diabetes. Now, we know typically that an A1C of seven or higher is what we would consider um, diabetic. But prediabetes is from 5.7 to 6.4. And then you may think, okay, so what about that 6.5 all the way up to 7? Now, per the guidelines, if a patient gets two readings in between there from 6.5 all the way up to 6.9, two consecutive readings, we can consider that person diabetic as well. So that's why you have that big gap with the prediabetes being 5.7 to 6.4 because there's that gray area that you would probably want to screen your patient um, a little bit more to see if that was a fluke or if very well that they are probably at the low end and mildly diabetic. Also, per the guidelines, if a person has a fasting glucose, an impaired fasting glucose of 100 to 125, that is considered prediabetes. Or if a person has an impaired glucose tolerance. So basically, if a person has eaten and then about that two hour range, that two hour area after they have eaten, if their blood sugar is still at about 140 up to 199, then we can also consider them prediabetic as well. Now, a person is at risk for developing prediabetes and also putting them at risk for developing diabetes if they are somebody who is overweight um, or obese, a person who is 45 and older, a person who has a sedentary lifestyle, maybe a woman who has have who has a history of gestational diabetes or PCOS, or even have a family member, a first degree family member that has di diabetes as well. So if a person has these risk factors, they are definitely people who you would like perk up and say, okay, they are at risk for developing prediabetes and even diabetes. Now, like I mentioned in my previous video, I have made videos that have worked together. So when it comes to treatment, when it comes to like, well, what should I do? How should I educate these patients over what prediabetes is and how can I manage it? I would like for you to refer back to a couple of videos that I have made over lifestyle modifications, as well as the food guidelines for a person who is diabetic. I've made videos where I summarize that. So I'm going to put that in the description box so you can go back and refer to that in your own time. Okay, so let's talk about how do we go about dealing with the person who we have found to be pre-diabetic or have pre-diabetes, what do we do? Okay. Do we just go off a hope and a prayer that it'll just get better? No, there's actually guidelines out there that kind of guides us through what we should be considering, what steps we should be taking in order to prevent a person from developing diabetes. Okay. Now I have mentioned this on my channel before. Um, one of the resources that I love is ACE the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Now, we know that endocrinologists, they are the specialists that you would send a person to if they did have diabetes. Endocrinologists, they do everything in the endocrine system. So it's not just diabetes that they manage. They manage anything that's endocrine, metabolic syndromes, anything like that, diseases, conditions, they do it all. Anything that falls within the endocrine system and diabetes happens to fall within the endocrine system. And so because they 
they are the specialists and because they're the specialists, they tend to be a little bit more aggressive with their care because they're the specialists. OK, this is what they specialize in. Another resource that you can also um, reference is the American Diabetes Association, ADA. They also have algorithms for diabetes as well. Now, personally, this is my personal preference. This is not something written in stone. You would need to figure out what works best for you and what you feel comfortable with. But I tend to lean more toward the ACE algorithms. OK, now the reason being is because their algorithms are more detailed. OK, I find that the ADA algorithm is a little bit more vague, whereas the ACE algorithm is way more detailed. It gives you more steps. And to me, that makes me feel better. OK. <laughs> <laughs> especially with such a diagnosis like um, diabetes. I want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. But the great thing about both of these algorithms is that they both talk about the same thing. It's just one's a little bit more detailed than the other. OK, it's not that one is telling you to do something totally different than the other. They actually work together and they collaborate. The two organizations collaborate. So it's not like you will be doing anything wrong. They both work together and they're the same thing in essence. It's just that one gives you a little bit more details and more steps. Okay. And that's the ACE algorithm. So today what I would like to do is to go over the algorithm for prediabetes. Again, like I told you, ACE is more um, detailed and a little bit more thorough with a lot bit more thorough with different endocrine and metabolic syndromes. Okay. And conditions. So not only do they have a algorithm for diabetes, they have an algorithm for how to start medications. They have an algorithm for how to manage hypertension, how to manage hyperlipidemia, dyslipidemia, how to manage osteoporosis, how to advance insulin. They have all of these algorithms, guys. So if you're not if you're not following them, if you have not bookmarked them already on your computer, it would be great if that's that's a great resource. OK, because each year they update their algorithms just like ADA does and they it would help you for many different endocrine related metabolic related uh, conditions that you may come across in your practice. So what I'm going to do today is I've printed off which I tend to do. I tend to print off if y'all can see this. I was looking down to see if y'all can see it, but I tend to print off the algorithm. And this right here, this page particularly is the prediabetes algorithm. So what I wanted to do was just kind of go over it and explain it just briefly. OK, because when you first see it, it may be a little bit all over the place and you have to take a little time to kind of see what they're trying to say. So let's jump right into it. So at the top, it gives you what prediabetes, what the what the numbers would be for prediabetes. And I've already mentioned it, that a fasting glucose an impaired fasting glucose would be anything between 100 and 125. Like if you were to get just like a finger stick or like if some if you were to get blood work and a patient came in and you were to get labs, if that is what the glucose in the CMP is saying, 100 to 125, you would start to think that this person has prediabetes. OK, and then if a person has an impaired glucose tolerance, so that's basically if they've eaten and then two hours later, if their blood sugar has not normalized under 140, so it's 140 to 199, then you would start to think prediabetes as well. And so that's what that tells you at the top. It gives you your what prediabetes is. Then the first line, the first line right here, lifestyle therapy, lifestyle modifications. Now, the great thing about ACE is that they actually have an algorithm for how to manage uh, obese and overweight uh, patients and how to go about weight loss. OK, initiating weight loss measures. So that in addition to food and all of that, again, and in this packet, I can't remember how long it is. Maybe it's like 18, 20 pages. Not quite sure. But all these algorithms are in this in this packet, y'all. OK, so it's not like there's nothing left to your imagination. They lay it out for you. So lifestyle modifications. Again, I've made a whole video over lifestyle modifications as well as the food guidelines for diabetics, which that's basically where I summarized 
what ACE, what their guidelines was, because the document is like 80 something odd pages, like 82 pages. So, and it talks about all endocrine issues, not just diabetes. So I summarized the diabetes portion for you. If you have not watched those videos, that will help you right there. But then it also tells you, so you got your lifestyle therapy, but then we come down here to treat um, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular um, disease, and then weight loss therapies. Both of these things right here have algorithms in this packet, okay? So it walks you through what you should be working on with your patients. It tells you that, okay, if they have a certain risk factor that you need to be going through the dyslipidemia route and the hypertension route, and then you have the algorithm that you can refer back to, okay? Of course, weight loss. The primary thing with lifestyle modifications, guys, is that there is nothing more effective than lifestyle modifications. Let me say that again. Even when a patient is on medications, nothing is going to bring an A1C down like lifestyle modifications, aggressive lifestyle modifications. If people lose weight, it has been proven that if somebody drops their weight anywhere between like five to seven percent of their body weight, they can drop their A1C like up to two percent, if not more, depending on the person. So that's without medication, okay? There is, you get more result from loss, lifestyle modification, more of a reduction with the A1C there. So we never want to back off of lifestyle modifications. When we start medications, if it is appropriate to start medications, okay, it is always, look at it as if it is an adjunct therapy to lifestyle modifications. It's not, okay, now we're on medication, so we don't need to talk about lifestyle modifications. No, first thing you need to talk about is lifestyle modifications, and okay, now we're going to get you on this medicine just to help you to get you over there, to get you over the hill. That's what medications are, and I think and I, I will be the first to admit that when I went through school, that wasn't really pressed very big. Of course, we talked about lifestyle modifications, but I feel like the the climate is that once people get on medications, then, OK, that's what's going to happen. And our patients think that, too, is that, OK, now I'm on my pill so I can do whatever I want to do. No, you need we, the, the hope is to get you off medications. OK, that's the hope. And the only way you're going to get off is if you lose this weight and you start eating right. OK, and that's what you need to talk to your patients about. So that's why I'm spending a lot of time on lifestyle modifications, because like I said in my past video, lifestyle mods are really what will reverse prediabetes. That's it. Lifestyle. OK, and really, honestly, I don't even have to go through this algorithm because that's where it begins and ends. But I'm still going to go. I'm still going to press for it. OK, so anyways. Now, of course, right here it talks about your ASCVD and your weight loss. And it tells you that, OK, if somebody has cardiovascular risk, then you can go with the uh, dyslipidemia or hypertension. And then hopefully at that point with lifestyle mods, you can get them back to a normal, normal glycemia. And then you go on about your about your day. Now, if hyperglycemia persists and this is if a fasting Plasma glucose is more than 100 still and your two hour plasma glucose is more than 140, just like what's up here. Then you can consider you can consider starting medications and it gives you about four different drug classes that you can consider. OK, of course, the first one is metformin. Metformin as well as our car, our carbos are your low risk medications, meaning that you can start it. The patient's not going to have a lot of risk factors, um, not going to have a lot of risk taking this medicine. And you can it is it is used for prediabetes. So you can start there. Of course, you would definitely simultaneously be intensifying the weight loss therapy. So whatever is going on with the patient, you want to intensify those weight loss measures and consider starting those medicines. Another two medication classes that you can consider are your TZDs, which that would be your like acto, so your pioglitazone, and then uh, your GLP-1 RAs, which are injectables, okay? And so with those, you have to consider with caution your TZDs and your GLP-1 RAs. And so that is what gives you, that in a nutshell is pretty much the algorithm. And again, I will link um, this packet 
this a uh, link to this packet from Ace's website in the description box if you don't already have it and don't already know about it. But it's a great packet. Every year I print it off. I save it on my phone and it's really good because even it has a portion where it talks about what lifestyle modifications are. It talks about how to individualize all glycemic targets. It's very detailed. So you can see why I tend to lean towards why I lean towards ACE over ADA because this is just one algorithm y'all this is not the osteoporosis one this is not this is not the one where it helps you set up a, a care plan for your diabetic patients I mean it's phenomenal okay guys that's all I have for you I hope that this video was helpful that's always my desire that you go away knowing more than what you came in okay and if you're not already subscribed go ahead and subscribe ding that notification bell and so you won't miss an upload okay if you're on Instagram I'm really active over there my handle is at the diabetes MP and don't forget that check the description box because I am going to link uh, videos that I have referenced throughout this whole video as well as um, the algorithm for the ACE um, pre-diabetes algorithm. Also, if you have not, I have put together a NP uh, diabetes starter pack that has great printables, cheat sheets, quick facts, and it has um, even has like an insulin course in there. It has um, cheat sheets over each medication class. It's just packed with a whole bunch of stuff. It's just not like a one sheeter. It's literally like a whole bunch of stuff that I've just compiled that I feel that nurse practitioners should be very clear and comfortable with when it comes to the basic, the foundational basics of diabetes management and education. So that link is down there as well. If you have not already downloaded that, I'll email that to you once you sign up for that. Now, as we come to an end of August, this whole month, if you not realize, I've been talking about pre-diabetes and things surrounded about pre-diabetes. And I feel like it's only right that the next video, I come on here and give a patient education video, something that's specifically for patients. So if you find yourself short on time and need some help with explaining certain things to your patients and you want like a extra little extra help, I have a corner, I have a segment on here called the patient corner and so the next video is going to be uh, a pay the next video is going to be over pre-diabetes but it's a patient education video okay now before we hop out of here I know um, I've talked a lot but I do want to say one more thing before we get out of here let us never ever leave a nurse behind okay guys catch you later